can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, which I had no idea at the time how big they were until I got a text that said they sold to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out that interview with Peter. Um, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about it. You know, you hear, um, Sean, about people making you know hundreds of millions of dollars, but he started off as a street mime. So he would make his food and rent money putting a hat on the street to make the money for the food in an apartment. I love hearing those stories. Um, The founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talks about, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and he talked about how Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Imagine that. Um, So, you know, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. And we do that for, you know, for people, for what's been the best thing for my business in my life, which is a podcast. I believe it's been the best thing to help me connect and give to the people in my network and profile them. And um, we help the company completely run and launch your podcast. We distribute it across all the channels, um, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. And so you can show up and talk, spread your thought leadership, have your guests on, and we do everything else. Um, I credit to be the single best thing I've done. Um, It's not just a business. Um, It's about leaving a legacy. This is how John, you know, we're going to talk actually about how Sean, um, some of these groups have impacted his personal life, but I met my business partner through podcasting, best friends. We go on vacations together and also helps you leave a legacy for you and your guests. Um, And so if you have, you know, I, I don't talk about much about this, Sean, and John told me to talk more about it, but the inspiration behind it is really um, my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor who escaped Nazi Germany, and the Holocaust Foundation interviewed my grandfather about his story, just atrocities that he had to endure, um, and that's that his legacy lives on because of that interview, and it's on my about page on inspiredinsider.com, so if you want to check it out, but if you have a question about starting a podcast in general, I think if you're a business, you should do it 100%. It doesn't mean we have to run it for you. If you have questions, you know, email support at rise25.com and we're happy to answer them so you and your guests can leave a legacy. Um, I'm excited. Today we have Sean McGinnis, president and COO of YPO. Talk about making an impact because YPO, if you, don't, if you haven't heard of it, it's a global community of chief executives um, dedicated to becoming better leaders. And it's a platform that has more than 27,000 members in more than 138 countries in my opinion and other people's opinions, it's YPO is arguably one of the most powerful groups in the world. To qualify, a member has to have at least $10 million in annual sales. I was listening to you and Cameron Harold talk, people, a shout out to Cameron Harold and his podcast, but he was talking about how, I guess, the members of YPO in Thailand um, make up a, like a 30% of the GDP or something, you know, of you know, who are involved in YPO because of the impact, global impact and the national impact you guys and your members have. Sean began his career in South Africa, one of the country's largest producer of agricultural chemicals, and he founded an organizational development consulting business and an executive search business. Um, and currently is an advisor of two companies. Shout out to Newly, it's N-U-O-O-L-Y, which is a gig economy business for independent attorneys and REM Brothers, R-E-M Brothers, which is a hospitality and food service business. So if you're near Purdue University, um, near Lafayette or Dallas, check it out. Sean, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. What a, what a pleasure uh, being with you. And, you know, just teeing off of your comment about your, your grandparents in the Holocaust, I've, I've had the privilege of visiting Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Mm. <clears throat> several times over in the 20 year gaps in between. And I, I can't tell you what a, such a moving and emotional experience and, and what anchors it for me. And it's what you and John are doing is you're connecting people with authentic stories and you're paying it forward by, you know, leveraging the lessons learned. And, uh, my, I was just there in May again mm. and, um, watched, uh, you know, was at Yad Vashem and, and listened and watched, um, a testimony from a survivor that, you know, it was just so extraordinary. And her, her story was she was saved as a child. 
Mm. Um, and, and looked after by a French family. And she literally still goes back every year to this farmhouse. Remarkable story. Anyway, mm. I didn't mean to digress, but I no, really it's, this is what it's about. There's no digressions wherever they, like I said, what made you go to Israel? Well, we, um, uh, my YPO chapter was doing its chapter retreat and my wife and I hosted, uh, 20 couples uh, at one of our signature events called touch Israel run by members from our Israeli chapters. It's just extraordinary what this group of members is able to do in four days. Mm. It's really a deep dive, immersive deep dive into the culture, the Israeli culture, the Palestinian culture, um, all of the issues in that region. Talk about complexity. <laughs> oh my gosh, talk about complexity. And by the way, this incredible underlying willingness to work together for a cause which is greater than ourselves, which is literally, how do we make things better? How do we... How do we embrace diversity of opinion, you know, and not get sucked into, you know, hatred and, um, you know, agendas, et cetera. I mean, that's that we could take a year and not get through that. Discussion. Yeah. No, I love hearing your thoughts on that because, you know, hearing someone like that, a survivor or, or whatever it is, it could be, yeah. you know, a CEO or someone going through a crappy time. And oftentimes yeah. we only see the surface level stuff like things are going perfectly. And I love hearing those stories or I watched that the interview we did and, and hearing those things because it's humbling and it puts perspective on things. And, I, you know, John and I always talk about, you know, let's say we're having a bad day or something's not going right. Well, I'm like, well, at least I wasn't, my, my home wasn't burned out and I had to live in the woods for three weeks. Like I can go back to that and be like, okay, like really in the grand scheme of things, um, I'm okay, you know? Absolutely. And you know, we, we, we grow up in the United States and, and first world countries with this very naively privileged perspective um, where, we, you know, particularly those individuals who don't travel. And I always encourage, you know, starting as young as you possibly can to travel and travel affordably. And, but go and see the rest of the world. Go and see how incredibly fortunate we are, mm. particularly in the United States. And by the way, the most giving um, culture in the world is the United States. We're so generous and we're so philanthropic, but we also get bent around the axle with, you know, with things that are just not important to talk about when you see how suffering exists in other places in the world. Anyway, you know, and, and I still think we're an incredible beacon of light to the rest of the world and we should be. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's something that, you know, I personally am very, very, very keen to, to talk, you know, and I talk to friends about it a lot and, you know, debate and civil discourse. If we can have a, a rational debate today, which is increasingly more difficult, it's how do we maintain those principles and that beacon of light? Um, because that's, that's what helps the world get better. Yeah. I want to talk about growing up in South Africa and what that was like, but I want to start with, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success in, in business um, and, you know, helping run one of the most powerful organizations. What's been, when you think back, you know, on the challenge thing and tough times thing, what's been a big challenge or tough uh, period that you had to push through to get to where you are? You know, I think the first big one was really leaving South Africa. You know, it's never easy to leave the, the country of origin, all your connections, your family. Um, you know, that was, that was difficult. Mm. How uh, old were you? I was 25 and, you know, it was still in the midst of apartheid in South Africa. It was a very difficult time. I just finished, you know, a stint in the, in the uh, infantry in the military service and then uh, finished university and I'd worked for a couple of years. And, um, you know, I, at the time, you know, if I had a crystal ball, I'm, my decision might have been different, but, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see the, the kind of successful resolution that occurred in South Africa, it was a remarkable, just a remarkable thing that people like Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and uh, Frederick W. de Klerk, um, the apartheid era president who really galvanized with those two gentlemen and many, many others, lots of YPOs, by the way, participated in, in helping that go through. But, you know, it was, um, that was probably the most difficult. Um, and then going through a business failure, you know, I had a very, a very significant failure in 2008 with the you know, collapse of the financial markets. I was at the time involved in a real estate business building low income housing. And my wife, you know, who is a fellow EO member, and we met through, through EO, parents of YPO, 
we were both in real estate, different ends of the market. Mm. And within a week, all of the capital dried up. And that, was, crazy. that was a significant setback because you're, you're not prepared for it. Real estate 2008, don't mix. Don't mix. Yeah, God. <laughs> So what do you do at that time? Like things. I think it's about resilience. I think it's about grit. Um, it's about the people that you surround yourself with. It's the friends that you've made over the years and the mm -hmm. contacts. And, you know, it's being smart enough to have, you know, some kind of safety blanket. So my wife and I are big savers, for example. And mm -hmm. it's very important to have that rainy day money. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, and then also... We found living within our means, you know, we were we were not stretched from a from a you know cost perspective, and that enabled us, you know, to tack left, pivot, you know, both get involved in different things and and literally, you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. And we yeah. had each other. I think you know that's such an important the support part system. Of my success, uh, you know, or, or um, my life experience has been having you know. A, phenomenal partner to go through these things with and a support system at the time were you in an organization yeah, I was you know and YPO was incredible at that time not just for me but for many individuals whose businesses were significantly impacted around the world I mean you remember it it was devastating for terrible people. and in fact you know I think that's where organizations like YPO uh, are really the strongest is you know is at times tough times where we can help each other. Sean, you help oversee an organization of more than 20, 27,000 members. What, what's the hardest part about your job? Oh, boy. Um, I think probably balancing interests, you know, different interests and making sure that... Um, a lot of different interests. A yeah. lot of different interests. Yeah. Making sure that those interests um, align and making sure that, in, you know, that from a you know, from a communication standpoint, um, individuals understand the big picture, the cause, and really focus on the value and outcome, as opposed to, you know, I've got a particular B for a particular, I want to, you know, I want to be the, the my, I want my priority to be, to be number one, helping them understand that, you know, we're an ecosystem, you know, we're a, you know, we're a, we're a, a you know, afraid, afraid to, you know, going down a particular path, and, you know, we've got commitments, we've got things on the go. And so it's balancing all of that. And then, you know, part of that is really keeping the eye on the prize, you know, and the eye on the prize is really being a steward and, you know, providing a platform for extraordinary connections for extraordinary people. And if you keep your eye on the prize, that can solve a lot of a lot of um, a lot of the day to day realities of running any business, quite frankly. Yeah. So the eye and the prize and the, the, the underlying, the value that you provide so that you kind of use that as a, a North star to make certain decisions. What beautiful phrase, North star. I mean, that's exactly what it's about. Um, you know, you mentioned your mom obviously had a big impact on you. I, um, I wanted you to talk about growing up in South Africa. What was it like? How does that well, influence you? It was almost an idyllic, I mean, idyllic you know it, life is never idyllic right as i said but you know both my parents um were um were hard working people both entrepreneurs um my mother was one of uh 10 girls my grandmother had 10 girls wow seriously 32 first cousins <laughs> it's pretty amazing wow uh all great people um i was very close to all my aunts um and you know they grew up you know, they were Second World War era family. So they grew up, um, my grandmother had um, butcheries and um, they had very little, but they managed to... How do you even feed lot. 10 kids? I mean, oh, that's a great they question. go through like loaves of bread every day. I mean, that's oh my gosh. insane. And girls, you know, how do you feed and clothe them? You know, for a period of time... My no mom, idea. She was sent to, she was sent to a, um, a convent for a period of time um, because my grandmother was, was juggling. So she went off for a couple of years to the Newcastle Academy um, because she was juggling too many things. But you know what, people, this is where your question earlier about how do you get through tough times? You know, when you've got love, when you've got a community, when you're built with grit and determination, and I think, you know, the concept of the greatest generation, you know, the, the greater the, um, the trial that one
everyone faces, if you've got the community and you've got, you know, and you've got that, I suppose that like framework of love around you, you can get through, you can get through a lot. So it was a fascinating uh, time growing up. I, we were very, I was very blessed that my mother had very dear friends, uh, a Mauritian South African family called the Ray family who were instra, you know, I would say instrumental in my life in terms of providing, um, you know, the kinds of family familial relationships um, that, that I, that I still respect and admire today. You know, these extended relationships between families, you know, um, are starting to dissipate somewhat. Um, you know, mm. we would we would spend vacations um, at our friends' uh, homes. Um, we would do Christmases together, New Year's together, and uh, you know, so that growing up was amazing. I think the, you know, another big part of growing up is, I my parents had a um, had a, a, a African uh, gentleman by the name of Peter and Glovu as their houseman, their house uh, manager, um, who was with us for my whole formative time growing up. Um, and I, I, there's a book in this, by the way, because it's a very emotional story, but he was not allowed to leave our house after six o'clock at night. He had to have a pass to work and live in our neighborhood. All these just bizarre um, dehumanizing apartheid rules. But you know the bond that I formed with him and my, he was like a third parent. Um, mm. And you speak to my sister, you know, my brother, there was just this incredible uh, recognition, one that something was wrong, but oh my God, what an amazing man and what an amazing relationship. Um, and then just the beauty of the country, you know, it's an extraordinary people, uh, extraordinary group of people, extraordinary place geographically, so much potential. So it was a privilege growing up, despite the very strange, bizarre circumstances, you know, that people were living in. Yeah, you mentioned the emotional part for him. What was, what was his sentiments that he described to you about, well, you know, about it? One, you know, he had to be very careful in public in the way that he treated us, touched us. He was a very physical guy. So, you know, he would put us to bed every night. He would hug us. We would, when we would, you know, when we had a, you know, fell out of a tree and, you know, sliced a, a leg or something, he'd be the person to patch us up. And many years later, you know, I, I retained my relationship with him until he, he died. Um, but, you know, he went to, my parents got divorced and he went to work for a really dear friend of my parents. And I'd go and see him every year. And in his room, there were pictures of, you know, my sister, brother, myself, and, and he literally called us his babies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the difficulty for him was, his inability to express that very important part of his life, uh, and excuse the emotion, but yeah. you know, it, it it was very tough for him. But you know, he didn't dwell on it. He he re, he just retained this sort of unconditional care, deep affection for us, um, and we retained that same relationship, even though you know we'd moved seven hundred miles away. You know, there was there was no daily connectivity, you know, certainly from the time we were teenagers, then after I emigrated, I saw him less frequently. But you know, the, the indelible lessons that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that he, that he left was people are people. And you know, when you're loved and cared for, race disappears, color of skin disappears. Right. Um, <clears throat> profound, profound lesson. Yeah. To you, it's normal, you know, because you live in to hug some, it doesn't matter, like the color of the skin, the religion, but someone else who didn't experience that. I mean, it's hard for someone who didn't live that and experience it to probably even grasp what you're saying, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, my brother Greg does a lot of great work. He's got a diversity business um, and, he, and he goes and he teaches big companies, big fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, kind of as a white guy, grow, having grown up in South Africa under apartheid, he's there up on, on, you know, in front of these groups and he's leading sessions on the importance of, of you know, authentically understanding how you can connect at a human level. And it's yeah. tough for people. You know, if you've not experienced it to your point, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you de-layer that? How do you take all of those life experiences where somebody has told you that person is bad because of that? 
that you know religious group is nasty because of that how do you how do you delay that so and we yeah. all have it within us by the way i mean i have seen miraculous things particularly through you know through ypo where you know we we don't advocate we are a, we are not religious we don't take an, uh, a political advocacy position and when you put people together who you would you wouldn't even think would have the ability to talk to each other in a trusted environment it just miracles happen and you know that's that's what gives me hope in the world by the yeah. way because i see it all the time yeah first of all sean thank you thank you for sharing that and i appreciate it and thank you for sharing your stories and um I just want to be the first one to thank you for taking your time and sharing your wisdom. Um, and on my list, I haven't read it yet, but born a crime by Trevor Noah is on my list oh, to, to, uh, to read. I don't know if you've, you've read it or, or heard of it, but that that's, yeah. it's kind of a crazy story. Um, and I'm, that's definitely on my to-do list. You've got to read it. And you know, he's, he's a great South African export. I, I just can't say enough about him. In fact, he came to speak to, in, in March this year, we had him as our closing keynote at a big um, event for over 3,000 members in Cape Town. Mm. And he got a five-minute standing ovation. Wow. And, you know, he's just, he, you know, he's, he's the real deal. Um, you know, I grew up very privileged um, in South Africa. He didn't. And, uh, you know, not that my life's any less important than his, but what, a, what an incredible... Um, an amazing human being, a truly yeah. amazing guy. Yeah. So thank you, Sean, for sharing your story. Where should we point people towards? I mean, obviously, you know, we could send them to uh, ypo.org. Ypo.org. Um, we'd love to, if, if, you, if you're a CEO in uh, any part of the world and you run a qualifying business and you'd like to both give back and, and learn and um, be part of a community where it's about, you know, putting in as, as much as you put in, you know, you'll get out. That's a promise and guarantee from me. Um, we'd love to. We'd love to. Um, we'd love to have you look at it. And awesome, Jeremy. Just thank you. Um, yeah. What an absolute pleasure, and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Check out ypo.org. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand